Welcome to Chapter 22, Enticing Infinitives. So far we've looked at the indicative verb and its present, imperfect, future, aorist, and perfect and pluperfect forms in the indicative. And then we switched over to the participles and we've wrestled with the participles, the present, the aorist, and the perfect participles and kind of gotten them down and seen the great flexibility that the participles have. Now there's one other verbal type we need to kind of master before we jump into the moods, the subjunctive and imperative moods, and that is the infinitive. The infinitive will also be flexible like the participle as it's a verbal noun, whereas the participle was more like a verbal adjective, and it will have many roles and function in many different ways similar to what the participle did. So let's look at this infinitive. There'll be a little chant here, but it's fairly easy. Let's enjoy these enticing infinitives. Let's begin by discussing what an infinitive is. An infinitive is a verbal noun. In English, it's called an infinitive because it's non-finite. In other words, it's not limited by the subject of the sentence. And so infinitives in English won't take a subject. There's no limitation on the verb, and so it's, that's why it's called an infinitive. It's usually translated in English, the idea is to plus the verb. So, for example, we would have, he went to start the car. To start the car is used as the object of the sentence. It's a kind of a noun substitute that plays an object role there. He went to start the car. He went home. Home would be a noun. To start the car is a nounal substitute. In that case, it's the object of the sentence. To run is great joy. And now to run is a subject of the sentence, and so it plays the role of music is great joy, or Greek is great joy. And so to run is a noun substitute as a subject of the sentence. Now in Greek, the infinitive can also substitute for the main verb, an imperatival sense, similar to what we saw at the participle also, substituting sometimes for the finite verb. But largely for us to begin, it's simply to plus the verb. So blepo becomes to see. Erkamai will be to come or to go rather than I come or I go. So you just to plus the verb. Because the infinitive is a verbal noun, It'll function sometimes, as we just saw, as a verbal substitute, especially for the imperative, and it will also function as a substantival. And so there will be substantival usages, just the way we had in the participle, only it'll be different for the infinitive. Then there will also be adverbial usages as well. So those will be our different ways of looking at this infinitive. Now, first of all, it often functions as an indeclinable noun. It's indeclinable because there's no case on it, no gender, no number. And it can function as either a subject or as an object of, the, of another verb. So you'll have a main verb followed or preceded by this infinitive, which will function as either the subject of the sentence, the object of the sentence, or some other role. But the function of this infinitive will not be indicated by a nominative case ending or an accusative case ending. So, for example, we've got to study Greek is good. To study Greek is a subject of the sentence and therefore should be the nominative, but it's indeclinable, so it'll be just an infinitive. To study Greek, a nominal substitute for the subject of the sentence. Greek is good, life is good, and you can see that we can say other and using nounal forms is good, and so to study Greek is a nounal substitute here.
Now notice the infinitive may take a subject in Greek. We said in English it was called an infinitive because it wasn't limited by the subject, but in Greek it can take a subject or an object. So for example, to study Greek, Greek was the object. Stanley Porter notes that that the subject of the infinitive is usually the same subject as the subject of the main verb, if there's no other specification. However, in instances where the subject of the infinitive is different than the subject of the main verb, an accusative case noun may or pronoun may indicate that. So the subject of the infinitive often may be an accusative form, which becomes the subject of the infinitive especially in cases when there's a switch between the subject of the main verb and the subject of the infinitive are different than each other. So be careful, the accusative form with the infinitive can be the subject of that infinitive. Now it may take a negative and when you negate the infinitive you negate it with a may. You don't use the oo, that's only for the indicative. So like the participle you use the may form in order to negate an infinitive. But we've seen that before. Oo is largely used just for the indicative. So the infinitive may act as a substantival or nounal kind of thing. It may be the subject, it may be the object, it may take an object, it may take a subject, possibly in the accusative, and the infinitive can also be used as an adverbial similar to what the participles were when they were used adverbially. And adverbially it can be taken as temporally using our while, before, and after prepositions. It can also be used for purpose, result, or cause. Dan Wallace's superb advanced grammar has helped us distinguish between purpose, result, and cause. And so for purpose, purpose is going to be prospective, dealing with intention and a goal. So he went in order to see. It tells the purpose, his intention, his goal. His goal is to see. And that's called purpose. There's also a causal use of the infinitive. The causal differs from the purpose, whereas the purpose is prospective, the causal form is retrospective, looking back, why did he do it in the past? He went because he wanted to see. So here is giving an explanation. It's retrospective, looking on back on why he went. That's called causal, and the infinitive can be used in causal types of phrases. The result is an emphasis on the effect or the outcome. He went with the result that he saw. And it focuses on the effect rather than on the cause or the intention. It's on the other end, the result. Sometimes, to be honest, it's hard to tell the difference between purpose and result when the infinitive is used. Then temporal, we're back to our while, after, and before. So after he went, he saw. And that'll be a temporal use of the infinitive. So the infinitive can be used as a substantive in various ways, subject, object, taking subject, object, and also in these adverbial ways, temporally, purpose, cause, result. So it's fairly flexible. And that's what makes infinitives so enticing. Let's look at how these infinitives are actually formed. We've got a present infinitive, translated to continue to loose, present tense. There's an active form, luain, and a middle passive form, luestai. Really nice, just two forms. We've got the whole present down. The ain ending and the estai ending. 
And that's all there is. No persons, first person, second person, third person. No nominative, genitive, dative, accusative forms with a singular and plural. No, just two simple forms, luain and luestai. To continue to loose. To continue to loose for himself. To continue to be loosed. Simple enough. We like these infinitive forms. The first aorist infinitive is simply translated to loose. The active form is lusai. The middle form is lusastai. And the passive form is luthani. Do you remember that the aorist has a separate middle and a separate passive form? Notice the sigma stuck in. So the first aorist infinitive also retains that aorist sigma. And the theta is used in the passive form. So we've got lusai, lusastai, and luthani. Let's take a look at see how the second aorist are formed. Lapo is our verb, and it's translated to leave. The active form is lipane. The middle form is lipesthi. And the passive form is lipani. You see the ani ending for the passive is the same as we had in the first aorist, but without the theta. The middle form and the active form are the same endings as the present active and middle passive the ain and the esthai, rather than the i and asthai of the first aorist. So I think we've seen this before, where the second aorist uses the present endings for the active and middle. The perfect active form is lelukenai, and the middle passive for the perfect is lelusthai. You'll notice on the middle passive form, there's no mediating vowel there between the ending and the root vowel, the lu vowel. It just simply le loose thy. So these endings are all pretty fairly easy. We don't have the plethora of endings for the first person, second person, third person. And you'll notice how many of the endings end in this diphthong alpha iota, this I ending. So a lot of times when you see a verb with this I ending, start thinking infinitive. And next is our enticing infinitive chant. The infinitive chant. We'll just learn the endings and notice how it's organized. We'll first do the present and then the second aorist because those endings are similar to the present, then the first aorist and then the perfect. You'll notice the present and the perfect have an active and middle passive form, only two forms, while the two aorists have an active, middle, and a separate passive form. Okay, here's how it chants. Ain esthai ain esthai, ainai ai, asthai ainai, nai sthai. Once again, ain esthai ain esthai, ainai ai, asthai ainai, nai sthai. And one final time, ain esthai ain esthai, ainai ai, asthai ainai, nai sthai. A lot of eyes in here. But that's the giveaway that this is an infinitive. Now, aspect and tense with the infinitives. Actually, the infinitive also breaks that connection with time and tense formation. And actually, we need to think about these infinitives more in terms of their aspect. The present tense will be translated to continue to loose. It emphasizes the continuousness or progressive action, immediacy. Like you're watching the parade and you're part of the parade. It's going on right in front of you. The aorist is more undefined action. 
it's kind of up in the stands seeing the whole parade. It simply, it happened. And there's a little distance from it. It's kind of a base form, a background kind of tense. And so it plays that role in the infinitive. Not time, but the writer will use it to portray his view of an event. A little bit more distant, a little bit more oversightful, undefined action. And so it'll be translated simply to loose. Now the perfect infinitive will be completed action or almost a state of character about it. A state of being kind of thing. And this is looking at the parade from up in the booth three blocks away where they're overseeing the events of the parade as a whole. So possible translational glosses, and I don't mean for you to push these because but this will just give us a handle for understanding how this infinitive is working with the various tenses. But sometimes you won't translate this crassly, literally. But um, just understand the stuff in the background. The present tense, to continue to call. The aorist, simply, to call. And the perfect, to have called. And so we'll use those as base forms to work our infinitive translations off of. But of course, with the various substantival uses and adverbial uses and connections with, as we'll see in a minute, with other verbs and indirect discourse, we'll have to be much more flexible than this. But this is a good place to start and then go from there. In many grammars, they notice especially the articular infinitive. And that's the infinitive when it takes the article. Dan Wallace has noticed of the approximately 2,300 infinitives, only 300 are articular or have the article. So the infinitive may function adverbially when it has the article and is governed by a preposition. And so a lot of times you'll have the preposition, an article, followed by the infinitive. So that pattern, preposition, article, infinitive, is a rather common one. So, for example, we have acon, pro, to, tone, kosmon, ani. Ani is the infinitive form of a me. Looks strange, doesn't it? Get used to it. A me is usually strange. So a ni is the present infinitive for a me. And it would be translated, I had before the world began. So akon is I had. And then pra, then you've got the definite before the world began. Pra being the preposition, followed by the accusative form of kasman and with the preposition, before the world came to be. But it's used adverbially, and so before modifies the verb, telling you when it happened. Now here's a list of prepositions, plus the article, plus the infinitive combinations. Dia, plus the article, plus the infinitive, means because. So it's often taken as causal. N plus the article plus the infinitive is taken as while or when, adverbially, temporally. Meta, with the article plus the infinitive, is after. Preen, with the article plus the infinitive, is before. as is pro, with the article plus the infinitive, is also before. So n, meta, prin, and pro all take this temporal sense of after, while, and before. Contemporaneous action, while, antecedent action, after, and subsequent action, before.
ace plus the article plus the infinitive means an order that. And pros plus the article plus the infinitive is also translated in order that. And these are taken in terms of purpose and result and can go either way sometimes depending on the context. So it's hard to distinguish some of these purpose and result uh, clauses. Hoste plus the article plus the infinitive is so that or with the result that is taken in a resultive sense. So these are some of the options with your prepositions and the articles and the infinitives. This kind of lays it all out in one, one screen. And I think that's helpful just to get an overview. There's a thing called the complementary infinitive where the infinitive completes the idea of the verb. And these are special verbs that kind of depend on the infinitive to fill out its meaning. Some of these are static forms and other ones are regular verbs. The form day plus the infinitive, day means it is necessary, and then the infinitive will mean to run. It is necessary to run, it is necessary to jump, that kind of thing. Existen plus the infinitive means it is permitted, and then the infinitive, to run, to jump, to sing. Dunamai is one of our regular verbs, and it will use an infinitive to complete itself. So it'll be, I am able to run, to jump, to sing. So dunamai plays that role, and we're familiar with that verb. Mellow, plus the infinitive, means I am about to, or I intend to, run, to jump, to sing. So these are just a few examples. There's more than this, but these are a few examples of this verb, plus the infinitive used to complete the verb, and that's called a complementary infinitive. So the infinitive is complementary, and that's nice, but only with certain verbs. A final way that the infinitive is used is to trigger indirect discourse. Now, indirect discourse can be triggered in one of two ways, either first with the infinitive, or you can use the hoti form, that. And we'll have an example of each of these following. So using the infinitive, here's an example. Elegon hoi anthropoi au ton enai ton prophetain. The men were saying that, there's no that in the words there, but it comes off the infinitive. He was, enai is the Amy infinitive, he was the prophet. This is pretty interesting. Notice that the infinitive enai has a subject, and that subject is auton, which is in the accusative. He was a prophet. And then the, the tone prophetain, again in the accusative, is taken as the object of the infinitive. So it's kind of interesting. You've got the one, you've got the one accusative as the subject of the infinitive and the other accusative form as the object of the infinitive. The subject accusative preceding the infinitive and the object infinitive following it. So the order seems to make a difference here. And so here the ani infinitive plays a role just like a substitute verb there but then fulfills this role of indirect discourse. The men were saying that it's not a direct quote but it's an indirect quote. They were saying that he was a prophet. Another normal way for doing indirect discourse is using verb like lege again. Lege hoti blepe ton apostolon. He said that, or he sees the apostle. So here you have lege, he says, and then you have the 
Hoti, which triggers that it's an indirect discourse, and then it tells a summary of what he said. Now to direct quote. Remember direct quotes? Capital letters trigger, tell you that it's a direct quote. This isn't a direct quote, but indirect quote summarizing what was said. So two ways of doing indirect discourse, one of them being with the infinitive form. Here are a couple translation examples of the infinitive at work. Al ho pemsas me baptizane en hudati ekenos moi apen. But the one who sent me, participle pemsas, sent me baptizane to baptizane in water or with water. Notice the baptizane is the present infinitive. And normally we'd start it out with to continue to baptize. But it's clear here he's not holding people under water and continually baptizing them. What's being said here is possibly iterative to baptize whenever the situation comes up, or more likely it's a purpose in order to baptize. So be careful about pushing the present tense as continuous action or durative action start. It doesn't really fit sometimes, and here certainly it doesn't fit well. So context determines more than the morphological form. In, with water, that one said to me, so a regular use of the participle with the infinitive followed by a regular verb in the aorist. He said to me, that one said to me. Second example. Dia tuto on malon ezetun auton hoi udaioi apoktenai. Therefore, the un pulled front. Dia tuto. Because of this, the Jews were seeking, Zaytun were seeking, in perfect form there, all the more malon to kill him. Apoktenai. The aorist form of to kill. Apokteno. And him coming from the Auton. accusative playing the role as the object of the infinitive. It's clear here that the apoktenai is said in a purpose way, telling the purpose of what they were intending to do. The vocabulary of chapter 22. The first word is aiteo. And it means I ask. The second word is Ionios. And it means eternal. The third word is Apokteno. And it means I kill. The fourth word is kephale, and it means head. The fifth word is pino, and it means I drink. The sixth word is ployon, and it means boat. The seventh word is poor, and it means fire. The eighth word is tereo, and it means I keep or guard. The ninth word is hudor. And it means water. And the tenth word is Cairo. And it means I rejoice.